And my name is John Gorham, and I would like to just get some feedback from everybody before I get started with my talk here. Uh, if you look down below, do you see that uh, it looks like a smiley face with a little plus sign above the head? Uh, if you could just give me a thumbs up if you actually have a smartphone. So if you have a smartphone, I just kind of like to see everybody get a few thumbs up there. So yeah, so those are some of our our reactions there. I see uh, Kane's got a smartphone, of course. I think pretty much everyone pro should, <laughs> I'm assuming, has a smartphone here. Now, if you look down below on the uh, the bottom right side of your screen, you can see in the chat area, can you type in uh, whether or not you have, uh, we have iPhones or Android. There we go. I see a bunch of Android, iPhone 12. It's pretty specific there. Okay, good. iPhone. Yeah, good. Oliver's got the iPhone. Yes, I see. Great. So yeah, so it's usually it's either iPhone or Android. And that, that's pretty much the uh, the very common one here. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll come back to that one in just a minute. And let me go ahead and share my screen. And what I'm going to be talking about here, as soon as this loads up, there we go. I'm going to be discussing some of the waves of AI innovation here. And uh, again, my name is John Gorham and I'm with Education Solutions here. If you'd like to follow or subscribe to uh, my channel here, I post a video every week and my whole focus is on uh, simplifying ed tech or ed tech simplified. That's kind of what I, I like to, to focus on here. So please do uh, follow me on, on here on YouTube. And uh, I'd love to chat with you and, and uh, connect with everybody else around the world. Okay, now following back up with my question about whether or not you have a smartphone and more specifically, if it's an iPhone or an Android, if you think about the way that technology has advanced and, and how quickly it's advanced here, if you think about the fact that the smartphone that we have today has more computing power than NASA's 1960 uh, supercomputer that actually helped get mankind on the moon. So uh, this is actually an understatement. It's actually the the phones that we have nowadays, like these iPhone uh, 13s. They're they're even more powerful than that. Which it's it's really uh, it's amazing to think that that we have that superpower computing in our pockets. We're carrying this around every day, and and also think about how this technology is advancing every single year and, and think about how this will be in, in 10 years, in 20 years from now. And the fact that we've got, um, we, we've got the, the fact that we have so much uh, AI technology that, that is, um, that's being placed into these small phones here. Okay, so uh, we've got, uh, I'll, I'll use artificial intelligence, AI and machine learning intercha interchangeably here throughout my talk. But uh, artificial intelligence, I think the, the goal that everybody or the standard that everybody sets up is that it's artificial general intelligence. Will it actually be able to, uh, to think like a human? And that's kind of what, what a lot of people think of when we watch these science fiction movies and everything. But uh, more importantly, though, the layer underneath that is the machine learning that goes into this here. And that's like a subset uh, that, uh, then, that enables these machines using data sets uh, to uh, with supervised learning to, uh, to to tweak each iteration and and get better and better with with every um, with every piece of data that we that we feed it and we're going to look into with artificial intelligence we're going to look into with this talk natural language natural language processing which is what uh, Dr. Price and uh, Do and Professor Ribeiro uh, uh, touched on here was was uh, NLP. And also we'll look at speech recognition as well here. Okay, so uh, some of the results that I want you to, or some of the takeaways I want you to, to have from this talk is uh, to see that you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about some of the trends in AI. And then the purpose of this is so that you can be ahead of these AI waves that I'm going to talk about. And of course, an action plan that you can take after, uh, after listening to this talk here is to start learning about machine learning and uh, different AI programs. Okay, so I'm originally from the Midwest in the United States, and I moved to San Diego, California. This was many years ago. 
And the first thing I did, I thought I was, I have to learn how to surf. I really wanted to learn how to surf. And, and this was in the summertime. So in the summertime, uh, you get these smaller waves. It's a little bit easier. So I started building up my confidence. I thought that I could go out and, you know, it was no big deal at all. In the fall and winter seasons, however, we start to get these winter storms rolling in and the waves get a lot bigger in the winter time. So I thought, you know, I'm confident now and I've, uh, you know, I figured I could paddle out there. I started going out there and as I was getting out there, I could tell that the waves were getting pretty big and pretty soon you can see uh, this is Ocean Beach Pier in San Diego. They have to close down the pier because the waves start to crash over the pier. And so I was out there in the lineup and, and uh, all of a sudden I hear someone starts shouting, start paddling, start paddling. And I, I turned around and this huge, what seemed like a monster wave to me just picks me up and slams me down. I, you know, my board flies off and I'm underwater for what seemed like forever. And I was just being held under. Uh, I finally came back up and realized my board was gone. I had to keep uh, uh, looking out for these waves that just kept coming and crashing over my head. You know, barely made it back into shore. And this this guy is standing on the on the uh, shoreline holding my board. And he said, man, you got to start paddling earlier if you want to catch that wave. And, and I just grabbed my board. I was done for the day. I was, I was done for the whole winter. Uh, it really destroyed my confidence there. So that was kind of my big thing here was, was uh, dealing with uh, starting to paddle here, getting ready ahead of the waves so that you can actually uh, uh, catch this wave and not get slammed. So I'm going to tell you about the four waves of AI applications here. Now in uh, 1998, you've probably heard of Google and Amazon and Facebook. These are some of the big companies that came out uh, in, in the uh, late 90s here. And these were just applications that were focused on uh, just mainly internet companies. And so the other, the other ones here are, uh, are all Chinese companies here. Honestly, I don't recognize some of them except for like WeChat. Now in 2004, we have this second wave of AI applications coming through with uh, IBM's Watson. And now we're focusing more on the business side of AI as this coming around here. And then of course we start to get into 2011 when Alexa comes along and now we're starting to deal with more of uh, people being able to interact with, with AI here. And, um, and more importantly, being able to, to interact with uh, these uh, different types of technology that's inside of our houses. Um, so, so people are starting, are starting to talk to um, Alexa and then Siri started coming along here. Now in 2015, we start to get car companies like Tesla that are, um, they're, they're still trying to automate driving here. Uh, and Uber is trying to do that, Waymo as well. Now this was, um, this was a little bit older here and this has since been updated. And we can see that in 2018, we've got this fourth wave of autonomous AI. So now we're looking at something of a smart warehouse you can think of Amazon as now packing, uh, packing uh, packages using uh, using robots and AI here, agriculture, robotics, and then we have the autonomous cars that are still it's still coming along right now. Okay, so this was uh, this was something that that came about from Kai Fu Lee. Now, if you haven't heard of him, uh, he is the former VP of Google, and he's also the former president of Google China. So Kai Fu Lee, after he, uh, after he stepped down from being the, uh, the president of Google China, um, he took on a, ven a venture capital um, uh, deal with Cinovation. So he's a managing partner with over $2 billion worth of, uh, with the, worth of ventures. Um, so Kai Fu Lee, if, well, I'll actually just play this, uh, this short clip here. He describes the impact of AI and the impact that it's going to have on on us as a human race here artificial intelligence is the most important technology in the history of mankind maybe only electricity can be compared to it
Electricity took a long time to build up because you needed the electrical grid, you need to invent all the appliances, and even today our cars are not fully electrified, 100 years later. But AI is just software. So for software applications, for example, replacing people in banks, insurance companies, hospitals, accounting firms and legal firms, journalism, it's going to be very, very fast because you don't really have a robot that has the mechanics to move around. You just have software and data and it learns to do things. AI can, within a single domain, do a better job than humans in classification, prediction, and decision making. Many of the human jobs that fall into this category will be replaced by artificial intelligence. So jobs that are relatively routine, quantitative in nature, in a single domain that is somewhat repetitive will increasingly become replaced by AI. In some cases, the entire industry may be transformed and it's done with no human involvement. All of this will contribute over the next 15 years, leading to something like a 50% job or job task replacement. Okay, so when I first read Kai Fu Lee's book on the AI superpowers, uh, I, was, I was shocked to find out that there's a possibility of 50% of jobs will be replaced by AI. So being a language teacher, that was my first thing, like, okay, what's going to happen to, to me and, and to my job and, and to my colleagues as well uh, as, as language teachers here. And Kaifu broke down uh, th this, uh, this grid here. We've got the social and the asocial. And then, and then we also have on the right-hand side, we have a high dexterity, so something uh, where if you use your hands, so a construction type job uh, versus a low dexterity uh, type of job here uh, where, where you're, not, uh, you're not interacting very much with um with your hands uh so so he brought up uh the safe zone which is like a uh, highly social high dexterity um and then we have a slow creep which would be um ai is going to slowly start to take over some of these jobs here with a high dexterity but uh also a social where they're not dealing with many people of course he's got the danger zone in the lower left hand side a social and low dexterity and then he's got the human veneer that he talks about and with uh, with human veneer, he discusses how it's um, uh, you can still work this job, but it's got this sort of layer of AI that's integrated into the job. And that's actually where a teacher or a language learning teacher, in, uh, to be specific, would actually fit in here. So uh, it, we wouldn't necessarily uh, have our jobs replaced by AI, but we'll be we'll be integrating it into our jobs. Okay, so um, I, no, I'm, I'm going to transfer this over here, but uh, I, I saw Keith Stevens speak in Tokyo several years ago. This is in 2017. Now, he is uh, he's one of the people who helped develop Google Translate. And I was fortunate enough to go and, and listen to his talk. And afterwards, someone raised their hand and uh, they said, hey, I'm a language teacher here in, uh, in Japan. How many years do I have until my job is replaced by AI? And uh, Keith, I, I hope he was joking, but he said, well, I think you got about three, maybe five years. And that really woke me up. I, I was, I was kind of shocked to hear that. Um, but this was, of course, in 2017. Uh, my, my job hasn't been replaced, not yet anyways. So if we were to look at uh, this, this is an interesting site. It's Will Robots Take My Job? Dot com. Uh, I typed in waiters and waitresses. There's an 89% automation risk right here. Yeah, that kind of falls into what Kai Fu Lee was talking about. It's in the danger zone there. How about a word processor and, and a typist? Okay, that's something that AI could potentially replace right there, an 89% risk of automation. Okay, what about a middle school teacher, secondary and special education teachers? Well, there we go. We've got about a 5% chance of that being automated. So, uh, of course, we've also got the English language and literature teachers. So this is where I see that kind of human veneer coming in. So I think that we'll be able to, uh, to work with AI as a, as a language teacher, as, as we are all our language teachers. Now, one thing that, one of the main things that, uh, that, that I want to point out is that um, AI and machine learning what it cannot do. 
And, and that is analytical thinking. Okay, at least not yet, I should say. Um, it, it, it can't think analytically. That's something that only uh, we as humans can do here. Critical thinking, that's another thing that AI cannot do. Creativity, these are all things that are top skills according to the World Economic Forum uh, for 2025 are right here. So among other things, uh, leadership and social influence, these are all things that cannot be replaced as of yet. Okay. So um, how is it that we can stay ahead of these waves that are coming in, these, these, AI, uh, the, these AI innovation applications that are all coming in one after another here, and they're only getting bigger and bigger every single year? Okay, so let's take a look at some of the trends that we're seeing right now. Uh, we've got, uh, I'll, I'll touch on three of these here. So first of all, AI, we can see that it's producing and understanding human speech. Uh, we've got the ability to now write original text. And then finally, we've got learning analytics and emotion detection. Okay, so I'll take a first look at uh, the ability to produce and understand human speech. Now, this was in, uh, I believe this is in 2017 here. Uh, sorry, 2016, down in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, SoftBank started testing out this thing called Musio X, and this is where uh, junior high school students were, were practicing learning English with a, uh, an AI robot here. They would ask it a question, and it would produce an answer. It was, it was um, a very simple uh, version of natural language processing here. Okay, the next one here, uh, this is from... Uh, Google Duplex here, and this was actually a, a really popular YouTube video back in 2018. Maybe perhaps you've seen this one. I'll play a short uh, clip of this here, real quick. So listen to this. We've got on the left hand side. This is um, this is AI calling to book a table at a restaurant. See how I hear you. Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, Day, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually we reserve for like upper like five people. For four people you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or for next wednesday uh the seventh oh no it's not too busy you, you, you can come for four people okay oh i got gotcha. you thanks yeah. bye bye okay so uh one thing that i do want to point out is that um this was something that started off 25 percent of these calls actually start off with um a human in the call center and then 15% of them actually require human intervention for these calls. However, the training, uh, the more calls that are produced here, uh, the, uh, the better that these, uh, these natural language processing uh, platforms are going to get right here. Okay, uh, the next one here, we've got uh, this is the one that's called Lyrebird AI. And I'm actually going to step out of here for a second and, and show you. Uh, this is one here that we can use for... Uh, for, for voiceovers right here. So if you were to type in a text right here and you can choose a woman's voice and say, speak it. Thank you very much for joining the conference today. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned a lot from the presentations. Okay, and you can also change it to a man's voice. Thank you very much for joining the conference today. I hope you enjoyed it and you okay, learned so a lot from the presentations. Okay, so we can see that this is kind of taken away that uh, robotic kind of voice. It's starting to sound more and more like a natural human that's actually speaking here. All right, the next trend that I want to point out is uh, the ability for AI to write original text. So perhaps you've heard of this one here. This is uh, an, an AI text generator that Google originally said that it was too dangerous to make public right here. Okay, so this is... Um, there's a smaller version of this called Talk to Transformer. And I typed in, AI will transform the job market. Okay, so if we take a look at this one, within a few seconds, 
I had a, uh, I had a, a, an essay almost completely written. And so I took this, I, I highlighted this essay here and I checked it for plagiarism. So we can see that this came back as being 100% unique. Okay, so if I were to step out of here and just to show you very quickly, here's a demo, AI will transform the job market and I say generate text. We can see that this is producing unique text right now. Okay, so that's where I, uh, this is actually just a uh, shortened version of this. So if we were to come back into here, uh, let's see. So this is actually from Deep AI. So I did the same thing just to test it out in here with uh, the text generation API. So AI is able to produce, uh, it's able to produce um, uh, text here. Um, and the third one here, we've got learning analytics and emotion detection. Okay, coming back to this was an interview with uh, with Kai Fu Lee on 60 Minutes, and he took uh, he took uh, the interviewer into a, a studio inside of Beijing, China, and showed one teacher who was uh, who was teaching to several different schools out in the countryside uh, via hybrid learning. Here, now these students here, you could uh, you could see that they had. Uh, emotion detection going on, and they had a they had a teacher inside the, the the school that was looking for students who were either concentrating or, or who were sitting uh, distracted, and then they could go around and they could actually help out those students who seemed to be distracted. Okay, and then once uh, once they're done with their or during the class, uh, the the uh, information is being sent directly to the parents so the parents can actually track how their kids are doing uh, every day in school. So it's a very interesting one that, that uh, if you have a chance to see this, uh, this 60 Minutes episode, very, very interesting stuff that you can see about what is going on with, uh, with AI uh, innovation in China here. Okay, so coming back to the main theme of this whole conference is um, with, with the language, uh, is AI the language teacher's friend or foe? And I'm kind of, uh, I would have to say friend and foe on this side here. And I'd say friend in the sense that I can use, uh, I can take text and I can have my students uh, read text and I can have, and, and the uh, AI detector, detection software that I'm using will actually pick out mispronunciations, omissions, and insertions, uh, and give me a score, which I can later verify and then give, a, give an actual score uh, to my student here. So I can send this back to my student. They can look at exactly what a full report of what they missed and, and, uh, and how they can work on their pronunciation. Uh, later, I can go in and I can see the insights for this reading progress here. So uh, as, as the year goes on, I can see the, uh, how, if my student is getting better or hopefully not worse. And in this case here, I, I picked out a student who is actually getting worse than the rest of the class. So now I can take this software and I can go and meet with the student. I can say, okay, well, I should really focus on this student here. So I can see their accuracy rate. And I can also pick out different words that they might be having trouble with. So that might be something that I want some, some vocabulary that I would like to focus on as well in later classes. Uh, and then also uh, I can take um, a, a writing assignment here and I can get an editor's score automatically from, uh, from, the, um, from the software that I'm using. Um, and then I won't necessarily use that score, but I'll just say, okay, maybe there are some things that are wrong. And then it can pick out uh, things that need to be changed. And then I can give some feedback to the student. So here's that human veneer that I was talking about earlier that I can really see coming through. Um, I can also look at the document stats and then also check for plagiarism as well. See if there's any similarity, uh, if students have actually uh, copied and pasted anything. Uh, another thing I can use is reflect and I can see the, the emotion of my class here. So if I ask my students, um, and, you know, my progress in this class makes me feel uh, they can choose from a number of different uh, emotions here. And I can get a feel for how my class is is uh, uh, from day to day. 
Uh, now I can see that there's one student who's kind of like, man, doesn't really feel good or bad about it. I can pull that student aside and go talk to them uh, and figure out kind of what's going on if I want to. And then, of course, I can get an overall sense of how my class is as well uh, over time here. Uh, so if there, I might, might, I, I might need to make some, adjust, uh, some adjustments uh, if possible here. Okay, so I said that uh, I look at this as both friend and foe. Uh, with, my, uh, with my writing assignments, it might be my foe in the sense that I'm not sure if I'm grading an AI-produced uh, a text generated speech here or text generated writing assignment. Um, but it's also my friend in the sense that I can really figure out how my class is doing overall. And I can, I can, uh, I can get a sense of how my individual students are, are doing if there's anyone who's having problems or in need of any extra help here. So it's definitely my friend in that sense. Um, but uh, I, I do want to kind of reiterate that there is this human veneer sense of, of AI that's, that's being integrated into the, uh, into the language classroom here. So my advice to everybody listening here is to start paddling. Um, how can we do that? We start learning the basics of machine learning platforms like RStudio and Python. Uh, you can start taking classes online and you can read as much as possible about AI and machine learning. So there are very low cost classes if you wanna start learning about Python um, and uh, and our studio, their beginner level. You can find these find these on Udemy, Coursera, edX. Uh, DataCamp is a little bit more expensive, but it's actually a very good platform if you want to try it out. If you're not into that, you can also learn how to build with no code. This is a new thing that's coming up here. So like a drag and drop way for you or your students to learn how to build their own web apps. Uh, this is and I think that this is a freemium app, so you can try it out see how it goes. Uh, if you like it, then you can pay for the service here. Uh, also, uh, you can learn about machine learning for absolutely for free uh, with, uh, it's called uh, learning with Google AI. And you can take different kinds of data sets. And, and if, you, if you really wanna dive deep into this one here, you can learn about uh, uh, Google's TensorFlow uh, as well. So there's, there's many different ways that you can get out there and really stay ahead of this next fifth wave, or actually it's probably gonna be more than five waves, of course, uh, that are coming up here, uh, ways to stay out ahead of this here. So some suggested readings here as I close this one up. Um, I've got uh, one of my favorite books that I'd highly recommend reading is uh, by Kai Fu Lee, um, AI 2041. And in this book here, he talks about um, the 10 visions of, of AI for our future. And he teamed up with a science fiction writer. And uh, the science fiction writer gives these really interesting concepts of what it's going to look like when AI really does start to integrate into everybody's lives. And then uh, Kai Fu Lee says, well, this is exactly, these are some of the companies that are in fact creating these things uh, that, that are going to play a huge role in our lives coming uh, over the next 20 years. Uh, also, uh, for any educators, um, the uh, Horizon Report, the uh, Educause Horizon Report is a great one here. Uh, the last couple of years already, the um, Horizon, Port, Horizon Report uh, discusses AI in education. And you can, you can read up on, on that, how it's affecting uh, schools and education. Uh, and then finally, this is more of an, over, uh, an overview um, rather than a deep dive on AI, but this is the future is faster than you think with uh, Peter Diamandis. Um, and he's from the, I believe it's called the Singularity Hub. Uh, so it's a great book if you're interested in finding out what is kind of coming up uh, and what you should be interested in here. Okay, so um, I'm going to end it right there. I think I'm almost at my time uh, on the waves of AI innovation. And I really do appreciate all of you joining me here i'm going to stop sharing my screen right there and i don't know if anybody has any questions i'd love to to see if we've got any that came up i didn't see uh any while i had my screen shared uh yeah i've been uh, checking on the chat here so let's just okay. go back and see uh any questions um we had a question from we uh we uh, would you like to read your question let me just unmute one second um okay there we go 
Yes. Um, yeah, just I'm just, you know, about uh, things and jobs and uh, they get replaced and such, but just the teachers. Well, what are the human soft skills that educators will need to have and develop that AI cannot replace? Because that's, um, you know, I'm using all this machine learning and software for that my students can um, gain knowledge and skills. Um, and then I feel my job now is I'm more of a curator. I'm kind of like testing out and learning all these new things and trying to um, basically, you know, show to my students. But then I guess what are the other aspects, I guess other aspects of the educator will have to change since we won't have to be a knowledge-based expert, you know, so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, question slash comment right there. Now, one thing that I, I mentioned was that uh, AI currently, uh, it, it can't uh, teach uh, critical thinking and creativity. Uh, it, it's, it can't teach leadership. It's one of these things that only, as of right now, only humans and, and being a teacher in the classroom can teach these kinds of things. Uh, teaching um, social influence, uh, we talked about um, uh, critical thinking and analysis. These are all things, these uh, uh, skills that we need to be teaching in the classroom. And then we can use the AI to do these kinds of, uh, um, like the, the repetitive grading something over and over again. And we can see this coming through with a lot of our, our quizzes that can now uh, be graded automatically through uh, Google Forms and there's uh, Microsoft Forms as well. Many different ways that we can kind of cut that out and let the AI take care of that in a sense. And then as teachers, we can start teaching those soft skills that you mentioned. Did that, did that answer your question, Kui? Uh, I think I, he muted himself again. Okay. <laughs> I have to unmute him. Um, yes, he said yes in the chat. Uh, okay. There was a couple of comments. Uh, people were wondering um, what um, software you were showing. I think it's the Read. Is it the Microsoft Read something or other that you were showing? Yeah, that's um, called uh, Microsoft Reading Progress. Reading uh, Progress. So if anyone's one. using Microsoft Teams, it's baked right into the, the platform there. Mm -hmm. uh, really good stuff there if you get a chance to try it out. Yep. And we also have a comment slash question from Muda. Um, if Muda could unmute, let me just go do that now. One second. There we go. Uh, yes, yeah, a comment. Sorry, it wasn't a question. <laughs> um, I think you kind of uh, answered already when you're talking about creativity and what humans can do um, compared to machines. And basically, yeah. Um, Humans are what uh, Ian Wright, uh, he has a, uh, is a Marxist uh, educator, uh, has a video called Do Machines Create Value? And he's basically saying humans have uh, uh, universal causal powers. Machines only have particular causal powers. This links back to Kai Fu, Kai Fu, Lee's, uh, Kai Fu Lee's, um, um caveat that uh, job loss would happen within a particular domain, mm -hmm. i.e., um, where machines are very have particular uses, but it's in all situations, humans are basically much better than machines. So, yeah, I predict uh, language teaching will be here for a long while. Okay, that's basically. I it. agree. Okay, thanks. I agree. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, there is a question about any any courses on teaching language with AI. Um, not that I'm aware of. I, there is an, an actual natural language processing course that you can take on Udemy. Uh, I think this is uh, Aisha was asking that question, but I, I'm not aware of a, a one that's uh, integrated uh, AI with language teaching, that none that I'm aware of.